Coming up on a newscast, President Yoon received a letter from his American counterpart, Biden expressed willingness to continue open-minded talks on the Inflation Reduction Act. The South Korean leader is set to hold the phone with Japanese PM Kishida on Thursday. The U.S. has asked the UNSC to convene a meeting to discuss North Korea's provocations. While several nations joined the talks, China and Russia opposed holding a public meeting, arguing the council must be conducive to easing tensions on the peninsula. Busan International Film Festival begins. It's the first time in three years Asia's biggest film festival is back in full swing. Hello and welcome to our newscast. I'm Daniel Che here to bring the latest. Let's begin with our top story. U.S. President Joe Biden sent a letter to President Yoo Sung Yeol expressing willingness to continue open-minded talks on the Inflation Reduction Act. According to South's top office, the American leader acknowledged Yoon's concerns over the new rules on EV subsidies that would put South Korean automakers at a disadvantage. President Biden also pledged to continue frank and open-minded discussions with Seoul on this matter. The letter from President Biden is based on the two leaders' multiple rounds of discussions regarding the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act in London and New York last month. We take this letter signed by the U.S. President himself as having expressed Washington's willingness to take into consideration the position of South Korean companies. Biden expressed confidence the allies will work together to achieve joint goals. The letter to his South Korean counterpart was disclosed as the two nations carried out a joint response to North Korea's missile launch. President Yoon is reportedly set to hold phone talks with Japan's Prime Minister Fumio Kishida on Thursday. The two leaders are expected to discuss joint responses to the regime's evolving missile and nuclear tests. Seoul and Washington fired four missiles toward a mock target in waters east of the peninsula in response to North Korea's latest provocation. The USS Ronald Reagan is returning to the nation in another apparent show of force. Bae eun has the details. South Korea and the U.S. each fired two ATACM surface-to-surface missiles toward waters east of the Korean Peninsula in response to North Korea's intermediate-range ballistic missile launch the day before. Seoul's Joint Chiefs of Staff announced Wednesday that they precisely hit a mock target in the East Sea, which demonstrated the Allies' capabilities to deter further provocation from the North. It also said the tests show that Seoul and Washington are capable of striking North Korean launch sites precisely. The South Korean military also fired a Hunmu-2 surface-to-surface missile, although it failed shortly after launch and crashed inside the area of the base. The JCS confirmed that no casualties were reported and that it's looking into the matter to find out the exact cause of the malfunction. Videos taken by residents in the eastern coastal city of Gangneung showed a bright flash and a loud noise, as if from an explosion. Meanwhile, in a show of force against the North threat, the American nuclear-powered aircraft carrier USS Ronald Reagan Strike Group will return to South Korea on Wednesday. The supercarrier was here last week to hold a bilateral maritime exercise with South Korea, as well as a trilateral exercise with Japan. South Korea's military said it's very unusual for the strike group to be redeployed so soon, adding the measure is to strengthen combined readiness with the U.S., following a series of provocations from North Korea. The move comes after the Allies also held a bombing drill on Tuesday evening, involving four South Korean F-15K fighters and four American F-16 warplanes flying in formation. One of the South Korean aircraft dropped two joint direct attack munitions that hit the uninhabited island of Chikdo, located off the west coast of South Korea. This type of weapon is effective in precision strikes. The South Korean Air Force's F-15K fighters took part in a precision bombing training where they fired two air-to-surface joint direct attack munitions toward a fake target on Jikdo, an island located in the West Sea. Following the North's missile launch, South Korea's Defense Minister Lee jong sup held phone talks with his U.S. counterpart Lloyd Austin, where they agreed that the regime's provocation is a clear violation of U.N. Security Council resolutions. Seoul's Defense Ministry said the two officials also reaffirmed commitment to strongly respond to any kind of threats by North Korea, through ways such as deploying U.S. strategic assets on the Korean Peninsula. Pae Arirang News. 
The UNSC is expected to sit for talks over North Korea's provocation at the request of several countries, including the U.S., the U.K., and France. But some experts say meaningful outcomes may not be produced due to veto powers of China and Russia. Ms. Kyun explains further. Good afternoon, everybody. The U.S. has asked the U.N. Security Council to convene a meeting on Wednesday to discuss North Korea's latest provocation. The request was made less than a day after Pyongyang test-fired an intermediate-range ballistic missile over Japan on Tuesday. Britain, France, Norway, Albania and Ireland joined the U.S. in making the call. But China and Russia have opposed holding a public meeting, arguing that the Council should be conducive to easing the situation on the Korean peninsula. While South Korea is expected to attend the meeting as a stakeholder party, experts say any meaningful action at Wednesday's talks is unlikely. The problem is that we have already experienced that the, even though North Korea has launched the ICBM the last month, China and Russia, both of them the permanent member of UN Security Council, but they exercise the veto power. So I don't think uh, there is uh, uh, any chance that they pass the additional sanction in this time. Another expert says that China and Russia are unlikely to support a U.S.-led resolution due to tensions over regional security issues. Well, the U.S. is currently in conflict with China and Russia, also considering the fact that they do not agree with further sanctions against the North, it's very difficult for the Security Council to adopt a new resolution, even if the U.S. convenes a meeting. Western allies have worked to impose more U.N. sanctions on North Korea for its missile tests, but those attempts recently have been vetoed by China and Russia. In May, the two vetoed a U.S.-drafted resolution even when all 13 council members voted in favor for tougher sanctions. For years, North Korea has been banned by the Security Council from conducting nuclear tests and launching ballistic missiles. However, Pyongyang has continued to stage military provocations, launching more than 20 rounds of missile tests this year. A senior presidential official in Seoul raised concerns over North Korea's provocations, saying that the range of its missile continues to extend. Warning there could be more missile tests, the official noted that the regime is likely taking steps to conduct a seventh nuclear test. Min suk Arirang News. Elsewhere around the world, Russia has formally legislated its annexations of four Ukrainian territories. Moscow, however, does not have full control of these regions as Ukraine continues to reclaim more areas. Chen Minjung brings the updates. Russian President Vladimir Putin has signed laws that claim the annexation of four Ukrainian regions. According to documents published on the Russian government's website, Putin on Wednesday declared the annexations of territories that account for around 18 percent of Ukrainian territory. The move has been globally criticized as violations of international law. However, Russia does not fully control the regions it claims. Ukraine is rapidly advancing in the city of Kherson, one of the four regions Russia claims it is annexing. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said Tuesday that Ukrainian forces are making a fast and powerful advance toward the city. According to Zelensky, dozens of settlements have been liberated this week alone. Though there are some towns still under Russian control, Ukrainian soldiers raised their flags in parts of the city to celebrate the breakthrough. The president said the warriors will not stop and that it's only a matter of time until they expel the occupiers. Meanwhile, Ukraine's capital is also preparing for a potential nuclear attack. The City Council of Kyiv said it's readying evacuation centers and potassium iodine pills that reduce radiation absorption. This comes after Putin previously warned that he would take every necessary action to claim victory, including the possibility of nuclear strikes. With the war now ongoing for more than seven months, Ukraine's economy is expected to shrink significantly. The World Bank forecasts the country's GDP to contract by 35 percent this year. This is eight times that of Russia, as Russian GDP is expected to fall by 4.5 percent. Though Kyiv's economy has been recovering since April, the World Bank says the cost of repairing the damage caused by war would be enormous, close to 350 billion U.S. dollars. Che Min-dong, Arirang News. The Nobel Prize in Chemistry is awarded to Caroline Bertozzi, Morten Meldil, and Barry Sharpless. The scientists earned the honors for the development of click chemistry and bioorthogonal chemistry. Their accomplishments include developing new ways to join molecules, including in living cells. 
The Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences said the trial's developments led to a revolution in how chemists think about linking molecules together. The prize also comes with a cash award of around 915,000 U.S. dollars. The nation's prime minister downgraded the government's outlook for the economy next year, reflecting the rising interest rate environment globally. In Wednesday's cabinet meeting, Han Dok-su said the economy will grow next year by 2.1 percent. Recently, the IMF and the OECD also lowered South Korea's forecast. But this is the first adjustment at the governmental level since the UN administration unveiled its main policies back in June. For this year, the finance ministry expects an increase in the outlook to 2.7 percent. According to the PM, inflation has been coming down by the raised concerns over volatility in the exchange rate and a more general economic slowdown. In September, consumer prices rose 5.6 percent on year, remaining below 6 percent for the second month in a row. The peak of inflation has been around the corner for months, but some experts see it finally coming this month. Ideon helps us look beyond the numbers. South Korea's recent consumer prices appear to be easing. At least that's what data released by Statistics Korea on Wednesday shows. According to the latest report, last month's consumer price index came in at 108.93, which is an increase of 5.6 percent compared to the same period last year. It's the second consecutive month that an on-year figure has remained below 6 percent. Statistics Korea says September's index was largely backed by industrial goods, especially petroleum products. Petroleum products increased 16.6 percent on year, continuing a downward trend from the peak in June. Industrial products overall rose 6.7 percent, while agriculture and livestock were up 6.2 percent. With the government already forecasting consumer prices to reach their peak in October, all eyes are on whether the public will begin to see some of their financial burden eased. Experts also say consumer prices may see an increase in October following a rise in gas and electricity prices and a high $1 exchange rate. Meanwhile, despite two months of falling prices, consumers are still concerned about high prices as they say it's still time to tighten belts. The price of cabbage is so high, it's really making me hesitant about buying groceries. Ingredients are expensive, so I'm thinking of buying kimchi instead of making it myself. I tend to look for coupons to watch movies or go see exhibitions. It makes prices of tickets more affordable. Asked how long the inflation will likely go on for, one expert says it might continue through to the end of this year depending on further interest rate hikes. It all depends on whether the U.S. will continue to raise their interest rate. If the Fed raises the rates throughout next year, South Korea will likely raise rates too to prevent domestic capital outflow to the U.S. This will eventually bring further inflation. He added that the government's expectations, which indicate prices to steadily ease from October, should rather be seen as an optimistic view instead of an absolute prediction. Lee Dae-hyun, Arirang News. Despite the uncertainty in the global economy, South Korea saw a record high overseas investment in the first nine months of the year. The trade ministry believes the rise was led by manufacturing, mainly semiconductors, EVs and batteries. Here's Am Jung with a breakdown of the digits. Foreign direct investment pledges to South Korea during the first nine months of this year hit an all-time high. The Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy said Wednesday the country received some 21.5 billion U.S. dollars of FDI commitments, up more than 18 percent on-year. The Trade Ministry said despite global inflation, uncertainties at home and abroad and rate hikes in major economies, FDI pledges for the first three quarters of this year excelled to surpass 20 billion dollars for the first time. The ministry attributed the rise to investment in the manufacturing sector. Investment in the manufacturing industry surged as high-tech sectors including semiconductors, electric vehicles and rechargeable batteries also higher quality investments. The manufacturing sector received some $7.8 billion of FDI commitments, up 152 percent compared to the same period a year earlier. Particularly, FDI in electronics soared by more than 230 percent on-year. 
The ministry said the government has been expanding efforts to attract more investment in the country's strategic technology. Last month, President Yu's trip to the U.S. attracted $1.15 billion of quality investments, including in R&D centers of semiconductors and electric vehicles and wind power complexes. He added, following global supply chain reforms, South Korea's industry base, innovation and talent pools are being viewed more positively. However, will this upward trend continue? The rise in FDI is led by semiconductors and eco-friendly cars. Foreigners seem to see them as lucrative investments as the growth of those industries has been very fast. I believe this trend will continue for a while. In order to reach for more investment, the government plans reforms of unnecessary regulations and to provide tax benefits for foreign companies and workers. Om ji Arirang News. The government aims to nurture 30,000 young farmers and upgrade farms to modern ones. President Yoon Jung-il vowed full support after some hands-on experience at the nation's smart farms. Yoon Jung-min provides a glimpse of what to expect. President Yoon Song Yeol's ninth emergency meeting on economic affairs Wednesday took the South Korean leader to a smart firm Innovation Valley in the city of Sangju, some 200 kilometers from the nation's capital. It's a cluster of farming facilities run by young farmers who incorporate key technologies like big data and artificial intelligence. The government aims to raise 30,000 young farmers in the next five years, providing them with financial support with longer maturity period and lower interest rates. Also, they will be equipped with farming machines that use data and artificial intelligence such as autonomous tractors, drones and robots, with the goal of upgrading Korea's overall farming system. More farmers, some 562,000, will be eligible for government subsidies as the authorities ease rules to help struggling farmers and bolster public direct payment system to cover staple crops that are deemed crucial. The Korean government will also continue to partially cover costs for fertilizers, feeds or other materials to tackle supply chain disruption due to the Russian invasion of Ukraine and to ease burdens stemming from higher interest rates. Yoon Jong-mi, Arirang News. Now, the parliament's government audit, the newly appointed health minister took center stage. Cho Gi-hung promised to focus on improving welfare for minorities. But throughout the day, rival parties clashed over various issues, including the unit administration's tax cut plans. Yi Gyeong brings the highlights from that session. On his first day in office, Health Minister Cho Gyu Hong headed to the National Assembly for a government audit session instead of an inauguration ceremony. I will do my utmost for the welfare of social minorities and to improve medical services for the vulnerable. The former vice health minister also laid out plans to contain COVID-19 without social distancing and make South Korea a global bio powerhouse, among other key agendas. Having previously worked in the finance ministry in charge of the budget, he also emphasized the importance of fiscal soundness and investment for what he called sustainable welfare. Cho Gu Hong is the first health minister under the Yoon Suk Yeol administration. He finally takes up the post that has been vacant for four months since President Yoon took office. Meanwhile, the Yoon government's tax cut plan swept through the other audit room. The main opposition Democratic Party called for the plans to be dropped, citing the UK's retraction of similar plans due to concerns over increased debt. Such a concern, the government says, has no relevance to South Korea. The UK decided to partially drop its tax cut plans, taking the IMF's advice. I'm afraid South Korea could also get the same advice. The very reason behind the UK's retraction was fiscal soundness. And the UK's program cuts income tax for the top earners, but ours cut income tax for the low-income bracket. 
Also under scrutiny was the government's plan to cut the maximum corporate tax from 25 percent to 22 percent. It's a tax cut for the wealthy, isn't it? The ruling People Power Party went on the defensive, saying it benefits all. Corporate tax cuts and increased investment facilitate prosperity for small companies as well as small business owners on the street. The whole city feels the benefits. The ruling party also called for ease regulations in a bid to attract more domestic companies that have set up businesses abroad to return to South Korea. Young-un, Arirang News. Asia's biggest cinema festa, the Busan International Film Festival, kicked off Wednesday evening. It's the first time in three years it's back in full swing. Kim Hyo-sung brings us the sights and sound from the hotly anticipated opener. Asia's biggest film fiesta kicked off on Wednesday. Movie lovers streamed in to the vibrant port city of Busan for the 27th Busan International Film Festival. It's back in full for the first time in three years, after the COVID-forced hiatus. Excitement buzzed in the air. I looked around the venue and there seems to be so much to see and do. Now that the festival is back again, I really, really hope that Busan Film Festival goes further internationally. Some of South Korea's and Asia's biggest on-screen talents also graced Busan's red carpet, including South Korean actors Hong Kang-ho and Han Ji-min, internationally recognized Hong Kong actor Tony Long chiu Wai, and Thailand's beloved Mario Maurer. The festival is a 10-day-long movie frenzy, with more than 350 films screening on 30 screens near Busan's Haeundae Beach area. Most films here have been invited from overseas. Iranian film Scent of Wind opened the festival. The Busan Film Festival has helped with the development and progress of Iranian cinema a lot. It's very important for Iranian cinema because in the festival, they always try to keep the balance between the art and letting the art breathe freely. It's not just about the storytelling films. The Busan Film Festival has played a crucial role in fostering Asian cinema and promoting it to the world. Projects like Asia Cinema Fund, Asian Contents and Film Market, Platform Busan and Asia Contents Awards help well-deserving Asian films get funding and recognition. Asian films are often undervalued by the public. The Busan Film Festival was made to break that. Our festival wants to show the world that there are these many voices in Asia, including Korea, and that our films do not fall behind. Films from more than 70 countries worldwide have landed here in Busan. And Japanese film A Man, directed by Ishikawa K, will be closing this 10-day run. This festival will serve up a rich tapestry of films for cinema lovers to enjoy and will be a chance to rediscover some of Asia's most creative Minds. Kim Hyun-sung, Arirang News, Busan. A few rain showers with breezy conditions are forecast for tomorrow. Temperatures will stay a couple degrees lower than the seasonal norms. Highs in Seoul will only reach 19 degrees Celsius, while places like Daegwalleung and Gangwon-do province will be nearing 12 degrees Celsius. As cold winds are coming in from the northwest, conditions may feel colder than the actual readings, so make sure to wrap up extra warm. Eastern Gangwon-do province will see rain until this Friday. Expect about 100 millimeters. The coastlines of Gyeongsangbuk-do province will see 10 to 50. The Saw metropolitan area and the surrounding regions will only see some light raindrops. For mountainous regions of Gangwon-do province, where temperatures are especially low, rain may turn into snow. Most regions will see rain for the morning hours. Lows in Seoul will be starting off at 13 degrees. And daily highs in Gwangju will be reaching 21, Chuncheon 18, Daegu and Gyeongju will be topping out at 20 degrees Celsius. Morning temperatures in Seoul will plummet to 9 degrees on Saturday, causing wide temperature gaps. On Sunday, another round of nationwide rain is in the forecast. That's all for now, and here are the weather conditions around the world.
And that's all from us. As always, thank you for watching.